we can take our places this morning. Um, I've already had three people uh, independently ask me if there was something special going on today, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we are here to worship the living God, and every time we come together, that is something special, uh, and I hope something unique. Today, uh, as, we, as we come this morning to worship the Lord our God, uh, I want us to keep the focus on the cross. We try to make that as easy as possible for each one of you, but I want us to remember that when we come, um, it may not be set up this way every time, but when we come, and every time we gather in this place for, for this new song worship service, whether the cross is here or here, the focus is on Christ, the focus is on the love of our God, the grace of our, of our God. Uh, this morning, as we celebrate Holy Communion, we prepare ourselves. Let's, with every ounce of our being, let's remember the one who came before us, the one who brings us here. Lord God, we, 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 lift, we lift this moment of praise and adoration to you, our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.
surrounds us and is within us, always, always beckoning closer to him, always beckoning out into the world, but behind him, behind the cross. This morning I want us to go to God uh, in prayer, remembering he is, he is the one who roars like a lion at times, he's the one who speaks in that still, small voice at other times, but he's the one who is always here with us, always watching over us, always loving us. Let's go to God in prayer. For God, as we come before you this morning, we thank you once again for your constant love and abiding presence in our lives. For grace, grace abundant and free. Grace that we can't really define, we can't explain, we can, we can only try to accept and, and live and respond to. We thank you for creation, for the beauty of each day you give us, rain or shine. We thank you for life, for every breath that comes our way, and for the future life that lies before us. And this morning, this morning, God, we thank you for the cross, for all that it represents for us, for all that you did for us through this cross. God, we thank you for sending your son to this world because you loved us, all of us, so very much. Jesus, we thank you for dying for us. And we didn't deserve it. We still don't. Holy Spirit, we thank you for filling us, for coming and touching us in our weakest moments renewing and strengthening us and reminding us of all that you give to us. Oh God, send us out renewed and refreshed. Send us out ready to serve you, ready to, to, to be your children. Send us out, God, ready to do your will. And most of all this morning, God, send us out full of your grace. We give you our praise. We thank you for all you offer us this day. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus, remembering how he taught each of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to share just a few announcements with you this morning, besides just, just how grateful I am for each of you to be here uh, with us this morning. And we'll just take it as, as, as it's coming. Um, in, in spite of what's in your bulletin, I do want to uh, remind you, if you've not received the word that we have postponed the baby shower for Nora Sykes, um, we're, we're just going to wait till uh, all, all things legal are cleared up and, and uh, the, the Sykes felt a little, better, a, little, a little bit better about that as well. So we're going to postpone that, which frees everybody to come out on time to a fishing derby. Now I've got the fishing lady herself, Debbie Glenn, here to share with us a little bit about that. We are going to have it rain.
You look at me wondering if she's serious, aren't you? <laughs> he I'm is going to get the fish. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I've still got a sermon to come, so I might just change my sermon real, 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 real soon about that. Um, I think I will be there. I hope all of you will be there and, and come on out today. And the fish have not swum away yet, right? No, they're, they're, they're the, the pond has kept them in spite of the rain, right? So let's come out. We'll have a good time and, and uh, enjoy that today. And, and I have one more thing. All donations go to VBS. So, you know, VBS is going to help you with your stuff. I was hoping she'd say, I was lying about the fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, no chance. Just not my, my day, is it? Um, we, we also, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of move on. That's, that's going to take us through, through this day. And then uh, throughout this week, we're going to be decorating for VBS. Uh, this, this really is crunch week for us. Uh, we're expecting a great crowd starting next Monday uh, morning. It's going to go from 9 to noon. Um, there's still time to, to uh, help out if you want to do so. But, but certainly this week, we're going to need a lot of help as far as decorating uh, it throughout the church. So uh, any, any word from on high? Will we have any times at night for, um, for people at like work and want to come help? There's gonna there's one time, I think we said six o'clock on Wednesday night, to make sure absolutely everything is together. Because I'm gonna be out of town Thursday through Sunday right before BBS. So if you want to really help Monday through Wednesday, then that would be absolutely incredible. So Okay, so Wednesday night and then Sunday afternoon we'll be putting things together as well. So so come out and help um, any any ways that you can. That'll be a VBS next week. At the same time, Arms Run Arkadelphia is going to be taking place. Uh, this is the 10th year. They, they have already worked on over 100 homes and have, uh, Jim Andrew says, a long, long list of, of things to, to be done. Now, the skill level uh, starts all the way from way down here, like, like close to zero level, which means you can pick up wood and carry it to people, and you can, you can pick up trash, and you can help out. And you can set tables uh, for, for the noon meals and, and, and the supper meal. I mean, it starts down where you don't have to have much skill level, all the way up to the top, uh, where they're going to be using some electricians. Uh, at times, you're going to need skilled plumbers. You're going to need skilled carpenters to do some things. And most of it's somewhere in between. Uh, you get the point? If, if you think your skill level is anywhere from zero to 100, there's a place for you in this. Um, so if you're not there and you're not working, you, you really ought to be either at Arms Run Arkadelphia or at VBS, one of the two. And I can't imagine what other excuse you'd have not to be at one of those things. But Jim Andrews is uh, kind of rounding up the, the front or the back or the side, or however we're oriented today. And uh, he'd, be, he'd be glad to talk to you about Arms Run Arkadelphia uh, and help you get signed up for, for that. Are there any other announcements that need to come before us uh, this this particular day? I have an championship title and we'd like to get it two years in a row so if you want to come you don't have to be an expert trust me it's okay yeah. you go out there and strike out nobody's gonna laugh at you we'll cheer you on still so it's okay so it's still so much fun but two o'clock if you'd like to come to practice we'd love to have some more people so if you hate fish come play that's 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 the way to go you got a lot going on a lot of things uh, to get involved with i can't find anybody anymore <laughs> Um, unless they've already been moved, there were a whole bunch of like jackets and shirts and skirts in, in uh, surges. I guess left over from UMK. So unless they're claimed, they're going to get taken to Beehive. And if you could announce that in the other service, I'll be picking kids up from the camp go. So I can't. Okay. So thank you. I'm just waiting. Any others? Let's continue worshiping God right now by offering to God his tithes, not all.
God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to give to you, to you who've given so much to us already. Pray that you bless us all from, from our hands. Use it for the work of your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' precious name. I mean, I really appreciate you setting up the cross and helping decorate uh, this way. You give us a chance once again to focus and just to remind ourselves in such a powerful way that this cross really is the focus of all we do, of who we are, and why we come. Instead. What can
continue um, our summer sermon series this week by looking at some of the stories of our faith. And at first glance, it's going to seem like I've picked a story as far from the cross as I could possibly get. It has nothing to do with the Old, uh, New Testament at all. It comes straight out of the very beginning of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the cross was not even around, as far as I know it. It had not even been invented uh, yet. It, was, it, it just didn't exist. And yet, if, if we get into it a little bit, we'll find that, that God is consistent. And that the, the, the real, the, the, the real storyline of God started from the very beginning and continues. And there's, there, there's just a tie so close uh, between Old and New Testaments. And, and this will be a good story, I think, to help you see. How that, how that works. I want us to go back to the book of Numbers this, uh, this week. Uh, it's, it's at the very beginning of your Bible. We're going to look at the second chapter of Numbers at, at, at the story of a faithful woman who nonetheless, sadly, throughout history has, has, has had to settle for the name Rahab the Harlot. Uh, many people, that's all they know. Uh, they, they, they don't know much else about her, and, and, yet, and yet this is a woman of incredible faith who played an important role uh, in the whole history of the church itself. Uh, let's, let's, let's open with a moment of prayer. But I pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds as we study your word. Open our hearts and our minds as we ponder the meaning of an ancient story what it could possibly say to us today. And help us, God. Help us see your truth and better within it. This I am we ask. This we all ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. The year was, uh, we're going to say roughly around 1450 B.C. We don't know exactly when, but that will give you kind of a, uh, an idea of when, 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 when we're talking, how far back I'm going. Somewhere around 1450 B.C., what we do know is that this story begins at the very end of 40 years of wandering by the people of Israel. The people had been released from Egyptian bondage. They had, as we remember uh, a couple weeks ago when I talked about uh, Caleb and Joshua, uh, they, had, they had come once to the Promised Land only, only to be, be, a, be, be pushed back because they were afraid of the giants in the land they saw ahead. For 40 years, they then had to wander around in the wilderness. 40 years of learning whatever they could about God, learning what they could from God, learning to trust, to have faith in God. And finally, God deemed them ready. A whole generation had died out. Caleb was, was still alive. Joshua was still alive. And Joshua was now the, the new leader. Moses had died. Moses would not enter the promised land. Now they stood again on the edge of the bank of the Jordan River, and, and as they looked out, they, they, they saw what they had seen 40 years before. Joshua could remember the moment. He said, we will not make the same mistake again. We will not be afraid of giants. Even so, he had learned a lot from Moses, and he understood the importance of, of scouting, of checking things out. And, and that's where the story actually begins. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies over from Shidon. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. And that was kind of important. As, as they looked out over the promised land, they could, they could, they could imagine the, the hill country. They could still remember the... the uh, reports from the first set of spies 40 years early, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land filled with luscious grapes, a land that could, that could just take care of all their needs. But they saw, what they really saw was a walled, fortified stronghold named Jericho. And, and they knew there was no getting around it. They couldn't bypass it. They, they, they were going to have to attack. So, so he decided to send out a couple of young spies. Check it out, especially Jericho. Check out what's ahead. Check out the biggest obstacle that they could see at the time. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now, if I were a cynical person, I would say that these young men had lost focus, that they had, they had simply lost focus and, and, and things were off to a terrible start. Why in the world 
would they immediately, these, these, these young, righteous Israelites, Hebrew children, faithful people, on the eve and the edge of a battle, why would they go to the house of a prostitute? Why would they go to the house of someone who was talked about but rarely talked to? Why would they go to the house of someone that, that, where, where, where men would beat, beat their path to the door during the night? but would probably have turned their backs during the day? Why would they go to someone who was, who was tolerated by the society but certainly not honored? Why would they go to the house of a prostitute? Well, it actually made pretty good sense, at least from, from their perspective. After all, the, the, the first thing they were looking for was a vantage point. They realized right away that the rooftop of Rahab's house, built as it was into the outer wall, uh, surrounding Jericho was a perfect place to look out over the city and, and, and hopefully not be seen. But maybe even more to the point, they, they needed secrecy. They, 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 they needed a place where, where, where people could come and go without being noticed. We're better than the house of a prostitute. And they needed somebody who could keep secrets. And if Rahab had a lot of faults, Surely, to have this business, she had at least one strength, and that was she knew how to keep secrets. I mean, that's just the way it was. It was perfect for their needs. The only problem was, it was really their fault. They weren't secret about their interests. Verse 2 says, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. They, they were spotted immediately by somebody. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. My, my gut feeling is that, that the king just assumed that, that Rahab probably didn't know who she was entertaining, who she was taking care of. She didn't understand what kind of people these, these men were and, and the dangers they posed. He underestimated her. She knew exactly who they were. And so with little time to think, Rahab made the first of three really important, momentous, life-changing decisions in her life. She decided to lie. She decided not to tell where they were. The woman took the two men and hid them. She said, yes, the, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gates, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You might still catch up with them. Of course, every bit of that was a lie. She knew exactly where they were. They were some three or four, maybe five feet above her at that very moment, just being as quiet and as still as they could be. She herself had taken them up to the roof. She had made sure they were hidden as well as possible under, under, under stalks of flax that she'd laid out to dry. She knew where they were. For whatever reason, however, the, the, the soldiers believed her. They immediately took off after her. Only, only, only she and the two spies above knew they were on a wild goose chase, but they, they were hot in the pursuit of, of, of national enemies, of spies. It was when they'd gone that Rahab made the second momentous, life-changing decision. And she went up to them, and she called them out, and she began the process of changing her allegiance. She, she began the process of giving herself to a new and different God. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above, and on the earth below. It was an amazing thing. An amazing thing for Rahab the heart, a Canaanite woman, a worshiper of Baal, to say. And yet somehow she, she looked and she recognized that this God 
that these two young men were serving, this God of the Hebrews, this God whose army was, was only miles away at this time, this God was greater than all of the gods she had ever known or heard of. That, that was the kind of faith that they could have that day. She began to realize that her allegiance was in the wrong place. She began to look around and realize that around her, around not, not only her lifestyle, but literally all around was the seeds of destruction, were the seeds of death. And that if she stayed this course, she would surely die. She knew nothing of a cross. She, she wasn't thinking in theological terms. The seeds of our theology today were absolutely part of this story. She realized that before her was a chance for life, for escape, for hope. She said, I think I want to take this. I'm willing to risk. I'm willing to step out into the unknown. I'm willing to put my faith in this God represented by these people. Because I believe that my current path will bring me to nothing. Now then, she said to them, Please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. She looked at these two men said, I think what you're offering, I think what you stand for, I think, I think the God you're living for is the only hope I've got. Please, save us. The men agreed. They, 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 they said readily, our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives up the land. And with that, she was all but committed. She lowered them, we're told, in the rest of the story in Joshua chapter 2 by rope down, down from, from, from a, a window in what was the outer wall of, of uh, the fortress. She gave them some good advice. She said, go into the hill country over here. She was certain that the soldiers had gone the other direction, the, the, in the direction of the Israelites. She said, you know the other way. Go into the hill country. Stay there for three days. By then, the Guards will stop looking for you. Then you can go back and return. But don't forget. Don't forget our promise. The spies did exactly that. They went to the hill country. They stayed for three days. When the time was, was, was at least a little safer, they returned. They made it back across the Jordan. They made it to, uh, to Joshua. They told him all that they had seen. They told him about the land. They told him about Jericho. And they told him about the promise they had made to Rahab. A few weeks went by, during which time the Israelites prepared themselves. When all was ready, they crossed the Jordan River. They went straight to Jericho. They encircled the camp, and they began a siege. That story begins now in chapter 6 of the book of Joshua, where it says in chapter 6, verse 1, Now Josh, Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out, and no one. Came in. The, the, the people of Jericho, they, they saw problems. They, they, they were already afraid. The siege lasted for, as I said, seven days. You've heard this part of the story. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. We well, could keep on with you. And, and what happened? And the walls came tumbling down. And we, and we learned that story. And we think that's the story. That's not the real story. That's not the most important part of the story, even. It's what we're talking about today. It's the part we don't sing. It, it, it should have been verse 2 of this great song. Because that's the part that's going to move us forward. You know that, that for the first six, dives, it was psych first six days, there was truly psychological warfare going on as the Israelite army simply and quietly marched around the city once each day. They didn't shoot anything. They didn't fire anything. They just marched. There was nothing the people within could do. They, they stayed just outside bow range. But inside the hearts of the defenders.
fingers began to quiver. They began to melt. They were already falling apart long before the walls did. On the seventh day, the army of God marched around seven times, quietly, purposely, still. And everybody knew this was the day something different was going to happen. When they had come to the end of the seventh time around the city, the, the, the priests shouted, and they blew their great trumpets, and then those same prayers, or Joshua himself cried out to the people. He said, shout, for the Lord has given you this city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. That's a polite way of saying be destroyed. But only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. Because she hid the spies from sin. At the sound of, of those trumpets, at the sound of the clay jars being broken, at the sound of the shouts of the people and the soldiers, somehow, whatever happened, supernaturally, the walls came tumbling down everywhere except that portion of the wall that housed Rahab and her family. They may have, they may have weakened, there may have been dust settling everywhere, but they stayed intact, protecting Rahab, protecting her family as they quaked inside. Can you imagine them huddling in fear? Can you imagine them huddling together, holding on to one another, closing their eyes, covering their ears so that they can at least try to mask the sounds of horror, the sounds of destruction and, and death and mayhem that are going on all around them. Suddenly, somehow, in the midst of their fear and in the midst of their hope, they found they were still alive. All of Jericho was destroyed. All of the people were killed except for this one group. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Grace, that's the most important part of this whole story. A little throwaway line. A phrase that you'd hardly give a second glance to. And yet that's what sets up the real story. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. This story wasn't written hundreds or thousands of years later. This was written by someone who is an eyewitness to the events. This was written by someone who knew Rahab personally, who knew where she lived, who, who, who saw her every day. This was written in real time. And she lives among us to this very day. You see, the third and great momentous decision, life-changing decision that Rahab made was when those spies came to her in the midst of the destruction, now offered her grace and offered her a new life. So you're going to have to come with us. You're going to have to actually step out now. Words will not be enough. Promises will not be enough. Now it's time for you to step out. Now it's time for you to make a difference. Now it's time for you to choose. You want to stay here? It's only death. Will you actually step out and become one of us and follow us and take on a new life, become part of a new family? They didn't have the words we have today. They couldn't say, Will you receive forgiveness of your sins? Will you accept grace? But they offered grace nonetheless. Who would have imagined that a Canaanite prostitute would be so accepted in the family of God? And yet not only was she accepted, she was embraced. You see, the real story begins here, the, 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 I think, far more important story. That was the small story. But God has this big story. A few years went by. And in that time, Rahab caught the attention, caught the eye of a young man named Solomon. Eventually, they were married and had children. And, 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 and they had a son who had a son who had a son, who had a son. And that son, that fourth generation, was named David. 
King David. Generations would go by in that same bloodline until there would be another king, King Jesus. Who could have imagined? Who would ever have come up with a story that said that somehow, in God's good graces, he would turn a harlot into a holy vessel? Who could have imagined a story that would say that someday God would entrust to the genes of a Canaanite woman, a worshiper of Baal, the genes that would lead to the greatest king Israel had ever known, and beyond that, to the great king of kings himself, the Messiah, the son of the living God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And yet, that's the story. That's a story that leads right to us. That's a story of grace, of forgiveness and acceptance. It's a story of new life. It's a story of stepping out and embracing the gift that God offers. Rahab, her story may have Nothing on the outside to do with the cross, but it has everything to do with the cross. It's a story that tells us that it's not who you are, but who you were. It's who you can become that's important to God. It's not what you're doing, it's not what you've done in the past. It's the potential of all you can do. In God's kingdom makes all the difference. It's a story that tells us that our past, no matter how checkered it might be, no matter how, how, how desperate and low and painful it might be, our past does not predict our future. Our past does not establish our future. God does, and God is always in control of our future. And maybe above all, it's a story that tells us God loves, truly loves all people. God can love Harley. He can love us. If God could accept a Canaanite worshiper of Baal into his home, he could certainly accept us. If God could embrace her and welcome her and open her and use her in the family of God, can he not use us? <coughs> God who loved Rahab loves us. And that's the message for today. That's the message of communion this day. Grace is for all of us. Rahab's time, grace was like two young men, two spies. It's been fleshed out since then. It's very different. Today, for us, this very morning, 2014, it's like a loaf of bread, broken, given for us. It's like a chalice filled with juice. us. This morning through these communion elements, we remember a God who has not changed, who still loves all people, who picks us up where we are, who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you come here today and you feel in any way shame from your past, it's time to let that chain be broken. If you come here today and you in any way feel like you've strayed, you've, you've, you've fallen away, you've followed another path and, and, and God can't possibly want you again, you come. You come to the 
God whose story doesn't change, it accepts you always. If you come and you're afraid of the future, afraid of that unknown, you come. For God will walk with us step by step, step by step, into his future. Above all, come and accept the challenge of being a child of the living God, part of God's family. Bread represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, given for you and for me on the cross. The juice and the chalice represents the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, given for us, the forgiveness of sins, for newness of life. Can you pray with me? For God, we thank you. For a gift that is as old as your time with Jesus, with forgiveness and grace. Thank you today for a gift that is as new as this morning, a gift you offer to us today. For God, in a way only you can bless this bread, bless this juice. They may become powerful, concrete reminders of your love, but now tools, vessels in which you will touch us again with your grace. God, we thank you for the honor you offer us. We give our lives to you. In Jesus' name. Help you. <coughs> this morning, because we have the chance to do it, I'm going to ask that you do something just a little different. We'll start with this section, we'll start with this section, then, then we'll finish with this section. Now, I don't care which way, the first person can just choose how you come, but, but I, want, I want us to use this cross today for what it was intended. It is the gap between us, where we start, and where we end up. It is the gap. It is what fills the gap by grace and gives us newness of life. I want you to come to one side. We'll just say this side. Just, just come around to this side. And, and before you come, just, just touch the cross. And let's let this side remind us of our sin or our past, or our need for God. Let's remind, be reminded of where we were. You come receive grace, but before you return to your seat, you're going to make the circle around the cross. I want you to touch this side. And this part reminds you of the grace you've received. The price Christ paid for you. The love he has for you. Let's let this whole journey today, this story, every part of it remind us that God accepts us as we are, touches us, and changes us, up, us into who he wants us to be. In return, we can spend some time in prayer. band to come first if you would like. Go ahead and make your, your circle around as well. And then I'm, after them, I'm going to invite this side to come with us.